There are a lot of ways that living and working in weightlessness impacts the human body. We've talked about them on many occasions. But this morning we're going to talk about one that you might not have thought of. Uh, here's Lori Meggs at NASA's Payload Operations Integration Center at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. We all see astronauts floating through the ISS, and it doesn't look painful, but it can cause pain. And now researchers are looking into why. Astronauts have been developing back pain in space, and subsequently there seems to be a higher risk of, of a herniated disc among astronauts. Somehow, NASA didn't know why during that time, so we took it as an effort in our group to find out what's causing the back pain and herniated discs from spaceflight. The idea is that in the uh, literature, it shows that back pain is a prevalent complaint and also some neck pain. And what's uh, interesting is that the spines of astronauts are actually longer. They're about two to three times longer in space than on Earth. Like here on Earth, we have this variation of our height. Like in the mornings, we're tallest, isn't it? And at night, we're shortest because of the gravitation. And there's a change when you sleep, it kind of, the disc kind of, and the spine actually lengthens. But 1.5 to 3 centimeter difference per day. That's on Earth. But in space, it's about two to three times longer. We wrote a uh, scientific paper back in 2008 when I met Dr. Hargens, when he, when he posited the question, um, like, uh, there is back pain in space, uh, what could it be? We don't know. So I came, uh, I came to Dr. Hargens and presented my ideas. So it took us about seven years to write the paper, believe it or not, seven years. We gathered all the pertinent information that we can find on low back pain in space and the most likely mechanism that's happening. So we took seven years to write that paper, and it became known as the pathophysiology of low back pain during exposure to microgravity. It was uh, the first viable theory ever of the most likely uh, event that's happening with the spines of astronauts. It was published in 2008 with the uh, Aviation uh, Space and Environmental Medicine Journal. And from then, then on, that was 2008, NASA had decided in the same year to find out what is it really that's causing it. So uh, we were invited to, um, to set forth a, um, a proposal. And again, what NASA wanted was uh, quite interesting because it was the exact same, um, exact same principles and, uh, and speculations we have. So we're now measuring the, uh, the spines of the astronauts with their scans and strength and, and subjective uh, scores. We're giving tw the astronauts a six uh, battery of tests. We're giving them uh, scans. We do MRIs to find out in the, with spectroscopy what's happening inside the chemical components or biochemical components of the discs because that determines the amount of water coming in or going out of the disc as well as the, the amount of chemicals for degeneration. Uh, we also do the MRI again to figure out what's the size of the disc comparing that to when they're standing up because there is a change. Uh, and then uh, we load them up with 10% of their body weight and we see that there's also changes. Now we compare that of course pre-flight and post-flight. The other test we're doing is a Byring Sorensen test which is an isometric testing of the back muscles to find out how long they can hold one position. It's in a prone position or on the, on the stomach but they elevate their upper torso and hold it as long as they can. Uh, we also have a dynamic test, it's called a kinematic test using a, uh, a, 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 flor a fluoroscopy and it's a moving fluoroscopy so it's basically an x-ray of a moving subject. We have these patient handling devices that the astronauts can use and we measure their ability to bend forward and backward sideways by measuring each individual level of the spine with mathematical and computerized uh, calculations. Lastly, we have a questionnaire. is the Oswestry questionnaire to find out what are they feeling? Are they feeling back pain before the, before the examination, after the examination, and before and after uh, testing post-flight? 
Okay. So where are we in the study now? How many have we had? How many do we want? Okay, we are approved for 12 astronauts. We uh, were approved in 2010, and so far our study is good for 2014. But uh, we only have five or six, five to six astronauts signed up. We have two completed uh, cycles of pre, pre pre flight and post flight of uh, two astronauts. So. The delay is due to the the paucity of astronauts. We don't really have a whole lot of astronauts going to the space station, and we are testing them every six months. So there's a lot, a lot of waiting time. So we speculate that by the time we're finished with this, this may be around 2018 to 2019. How do you deal with that? How, how does someone who, you know, you, you say results aren't overnight. How, how do you get through that? Do you know that you're helping someone? Is that how it? Oh, yes. Um, there's always uh, this uh, human need for a graffiti. Okay, and so this is the, the academic graffiti that uh, I would call an academic graffiti. Like every, every human being has to have this sense of purpose, a sense of mission. And somehow, in my case, helping out the space program because it's a need for fellowship and to help mankind in the future as, as space exploration. And uh, the bottom line is it has to be passion. The passion to do something that's worthwhile, that's something that's going to be used by humanity, and that's something that you may be remembered for life. And I think this is inherent in any human being. That's why the sense of awe for space exploration. And since we spoke with Dr. Sison, 12 astronauts have signed up for this study. That'll do it for us here at the Payload Operations Integration Center. Now back to you at Mission Control in Houston.